hopefully you'll stay through the rest of the week. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Luke, uh, who is a familiar face here at Berkeley Lab. He's uh, worked with several people here uh, in the physics division. Uh, he currently leads AI and engineering at Twilio, uh, which was acquired by, uh, well, he was, he was at Y Technologies, which was then acquired by Twilio. He's a mathematician from uh, Yale and, and then a master's at Stanford. Uh, he's also published a, a ton of work in generative modeling. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about sequential models. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so I suppose it's good that you guys are still here. Hopefully I don't change that. Uh, <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, kind of my, my goal in today's lecture is pretty high level. Um, I want to set up sequence learning um, kind of in the general sense. There are lots of tutorials that are flying around on Medium, random Jupyter notebooks you'll find. Let's try to set up what sequence learning is from a more kind of systematic perspective. Um, then I'm going to give a taxonomy of sequential models. So how can we set up the inputs and outputs for the different kind of types of sequential models that you'll encounter either in papers or encounter in different problem environments that you're going to want to work in. Um, then finally, we'll get into the deep learning building blocks. Um, that will kind of constitute these individual components. Um, this is going to be kind of a whirlwind of information. So my goal at the end of the day is to give you the keywords to then later Google. <laughs> uh, or when you read a paper, you know, kind of, you, you can kind of tie the thread together to what we learned about in lecture today. Um, so I don't expect people to kind of leave knowing how to go train the fanciest sequence to sequence model with attention, but just kind of you've heard all of these terms, you kind of stitch them together and start to build a framework for understanding sequence models. So in particular, we're gonna go through RNs, uh, we're gonna go through CNNs, and we're gonna go through transformers at a super high level. There's a lot of kind of details and nitty gritty that goes into a lot of these models. We're gonna cover them from a little bit of a higher level perspective, get some intuition, um, all towards the goal of having a good way to grok sequence learning and sequence models. So let's start with the basics of sequence learning. So the typical, I'm gonna put this in parentheses, supervised learning setup um, that we oftentimes have is a fixed vector input and a fixed vector output. So this is, I have readings from a sensor or multiple sensors or some sort of sensor array. I'm uh, measuring attributes about my system. Um, if I'm working in sociology and maybe I'm measuring like age, race, sex, income level, things like that. I have a fixed set of observables about my system and then I wanna predict out a fixed set of outcomes. So signal or background, whether or not a machine is gonna fail in the next T time periods, um, kind of a very fixed outcome. Um, we have some fixed domain, some fixed codomain. Um, and we wanna learn in the typical setup, as we discussed in the earlier uh, lectures within the summer school, um, we wanna learn a good function that maps uh, our inputs to our outputs, matching the state of the world. So we have some F that's actually governing this process going from domain to codomain, and we wanna learn a good mapping for that. Turns out deep neural networks tend to be quite good at this problem. Um, we learn this through data, but this doesn't really extend to the sequential case. So where does this fall apart? This falls apart when we have what I generally like to call variadic size. So we're dealing with features or an input space that isn't constrained to a fixed dimension. Um, how do we, where, where do we encounter these things? You encounter these a lot when you're dealing with time series, when you're dealing with kind of general collections of objects, we can measure any number K observables about our system. Uh, and each of these we deem to be useful. This is a collection of things. This doesn't fit into a fixed, uh, this doesn't fit into a fixed dimensional vector. Um, another place where you end up finding this a lot of times is in unbounded spatial domains. So normally when you're dealing with images, you've got your 32 by 32, 128 by 128, it's fixed or 1024 if you're on, uh, Corey, <laughs> um, you're fixed there. You aren't dealing with kind of variadic sizes, but oftentimes um, in a lot of applications, your images are gonna be coming in in various sizes. Your volumetric measurements are coming in various sizes from different sensor series. And when you're measuring some uh, Fisher process in like a, a, a groundswell or something. Um, so when you have variadic size, a lot of the standard techniques that you use tend to fall apart. So what oftentimes ends up happening is you end up building models with what I'm gonna call summary features or reductions. So this is ways of taking this variable sequence or variable sized input and reducing it to a fixed number of features. Um, and this has some problems, which we'll talk about later, 
But I think it's worth kind of diving a little deeper into um, kind of what do we call sequence learning. So I define sequence learning as a problem domain where at least one of the input or the output is of a sequential or variadic size nature. And the other key thing that we're going to throw into this, especially for today, is uh, what I call a naturally ordered sequence. <laughs> so we want to have an order to what we have in our sequential data. Um, I think about order in two different ways. There is intrinsic ordering, which is more commonly called strong ordering. This is where there is like a natural order admitted by nature. Events coming in in a sequence, words in a sentence, um, different samples from a spatial domain over time. These are, have a natural admitted order from nature. Um, there are a whole other set of uh, orderings that come. Uh, my, I did a lot of work in high energy physics, and this comes up a lot in sequence learning in high energy physics, where you have extrinsic ordering. So this is an ordering that is not coming from nature. We are reading, if you're familiar with high energy physics, we're reading tracks in a jet. We don't actually have an ordering over those tracks. So we kind of come up with one as physicists, say the uh, transverse momentum should be, the, the, the ordering should be an order of transverse momentum. We think that that is uh, the way that we should order the sequence to give it some sort of weak ordering. Um, so you see this a lot, um, especially in natural science applications. Um, a lot of the things I'll talk about today extend perfectly well to this, um, to this world, but it's important just to call out the fact that these are two very different uh, kind of philosophical <laughs> approaches that you can take to understanding a sequence. Um, whether or not the ordering is actually inherent to the problem or whether or not you as a scientist or engineer or whatever have to impose this ordering in order to use sequence modeling uh, to kind of its full extent. So when we represent sequences, we have kind of some sequence of vectors we index these on kind of a general order. This can be time, any other extrinsic order as we talked about. Um, let's limit ourselves to the case where we're doing typical supervised learning for a quick second. How can we use traditional models to work on sequences? Not saying that you should, but how could we? Um, because this will give us a good inductive bias for how to construct good deep learning models. So the answer, as I was mentioning before, is kind of summaries or reductions. So what do these look like? Um, you'll oftentimes call, uh, see reductions in the NLP literature referred to as bags. Um, where you just kind of take a bag of things and reduce it into uh, a summary feature. Um, but assume I have some input sequence. How do I get that into a single number? So I have kind of maybe a vector of sensor readouts over time. Um, maybe I want to take the sensor readout from sensor I and take the mean over my entire time sequence. Maybe I want to take the max, the min, the median, some other sort of summary statistic that comes out of the sequence of individual numbers. You oftentimes see this done uh, in kind of the older, older school literature, um, but this has some fairly kind of prominent uh, disadvantages when you think that the ordering or the temporal component of your problem um, actually has meaning <laughs> for determining kind of the outcome of the, the why that you're trying to predict. So you lose ordering. That's a huge, huge issue. Um, but in certain domains that actually may be okay. So one of the things that I'm not gonna get into today but is super relevant for having these sorts of reductions are unordered sequences. So actually taking like some number K of vectors associated with an event, with an example, and predicting something about them. They don't have an order. We don't even have an extrinsic ordering that we can impose over it. How, how do we reason about this big collection of things? Um, there, at least in the deep learning literature today, people use reductions still, um, because we don't, we don't really have a very good um, mental model for how to reason about unordered sets, basically, yet. Um, but this is a pretty strong inductive bias as to, you'll hear me say inductive bias a lot today. This is a very strong inductive bias for what is important to your problem. You're basically saying, I think most of the predictive power, I don't need it from the actual temporal component. I can just deal with the features summarized in a higher level form. So what are the pros of an approach like this? Um, they're interpretable, but sometimes. Um, I think interpretability is something that is, it's hard to pin down. It's usually very use case dependent, what we mean by interpretable. Uh, people will say linear models are not interpretable or are interpretable depending on kind of their view of the world. Um, so I'm not gonna get into, <laughs> into arguments about interpretability, but people claim that reductions, then uh, subsequently using uh, traditional machine learning algorithms that are kind of working on fixed size inputs and outputs are interpretable. I'll, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> um, 
I personally can't think of many other pros from a pure modeling standpoint. Um, sometimes they're a lot faster to train. That can actually be a very useful thing if you're dealing with absolutely massive, massive sequences. Maybe you'd rather run your reduction job on your Hadoop, Spark, whatever you're using, and then take that and, and build a traditional model on that. Um, that actually might be totally valid given the scale of a problem you work on. Um, but that's a pretty use case specific um, advantage that might come up. What are the cons of using these sorts of reductions? Um, and these cons will creep up as we start to build deep learning models that are essentially building continuous approximations of a lot of these sort of like some max uh, operations that act as a reduction. So they are brittle. When you create features, uh, as I'm sure everyone who's listened to a deep learning talk uh, has heard, uh, deep learning removes the brittleness of feature design. Um, so in general, building models on sequences, um, if you've ever looked at a sequence model pre kind of deep learning based se sequential learning, um, you see a lot of crazy features like the value of this like variable dips in periods two and five but doesn't dip in period seven and then like is twice as much in period 11. Uh, you see a lot of these sorts of um, pretty, pretty brittle features that maybe work but boy do they take a lot of time to test and validate. Um, I think the bigger kind of question here is, are you inherently limiting your, limiting your performance? And the answer is yes, if you have a temporal component to your problem. Uh, you're you're ex expressly limiting the amount of information you can get out of your data by doing these reductions. Um, very similar to kind of the first point, which is it's brittle. Um, you actually have a very hard time representing what you wanna represent when you have a sequence modeling problem. I might have a, an idea that, ah, uh, I think in 30 time periods back, there might be something that will indicate what will happen 30 time periods from now. Um, I could be right, I could be wrong, but actually building the features that get that into a model can be very time intensive and um, I would argue not the best use of time. <laughs> um, and I think the biggest problem that arises out of thinking like this is um, you actually have a hard time predicting sequences this way. This works fine when you have a sequence that is your input and a fixed thing that is your output, but now try to predict a variadic length sequence that's coming out of some sort of machine learning problem you have. Uh, that's pretty hard to do with summary statistics. Um, there are ways of doing it, but it is, um, I would say, highly non-trivial. So what do we want out of models and out of representations when we're working with sequences? Um, we wanna consider the sequence as a sequence, no, no kind of explicit reductions. Um, we need to be able to predict sequences as an output. So most kind of machine learning, supervised machine learning, when you think about it, you're like classifying, you're doing some regression problem, you're doing some sort of survival analysis, time to failure prediction. We need to be able to extend to the case where we're predicting a sequence of things into the future. Um, that's kind of the, the, the framework that we want to, to go into this. Um, and we do actually need to truly be able to handle variable length sequences, no kind of fixed moving windows over time. Um, these kind of do come up a lot and they can be very efficient, um, but kind of for the purposes of, of this lecture, we wanna not work on these kind of fixed windowed models as, as we go through. So as I'm preparing a sequential input, what do I have to think about? Um, for a non-temporal sequence, so I don't actually have an explicit time component, I just kind of have an order of things that happened, um, words in a sentence, for example, uh, or like a fixed frame rate. Constructing the input that goes into a sequential model is trivial. I literally can just take my, my sequence of vectors xi and I can feed those into whatever deep learning model I want. So there's nothing really to do there. Now, throw in a temporal component, work with time series, it is definitely, definitely not trivial. So as I said, if we're dealing with kind of a fixed sampling rate, and we know this because of that's, that's our setup, either we're dealing with something like audio or we actually do have like a fixed metronomic cadence with which we're sampling from our sensors, we're fine, we can actually ignore time for the most part. But most time series models and most time series domains, excuse me, um, they don't have this kind of fixed sampling nature. So we have uh, heterogeneous time differentials between samples. And that can be a real, real problem for deep learning models. Um, I'll caveat this right now with, um, I don't think we've actually solved this as a field properly yet. I think this, there are, there's still kind of a lot of research in this direction. Um, if this is something of interest to you, I think there's actually like a lot of very high impact papers to be written down this domain. Um, some people have thought about this by incorporating 
um, kind of a time gate inside an RNN, we'll talk about later. Um, but this is a really, really greenfield problem. Um, people have hacks, I'll show you uh, three hacks basically, uh, that get these heterogeneous uh, time differential sequences to work with deep learning. Um, but at the end of the day, we're actually not there yet as a field. And machine learning has had a hard time dealing with this for a long time. There are kind of traditional spline-based methods that can work when you're dealing with very simple models. But for very expressive models, we're just, we're just not quite there yet. So let's draw a picture. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> the classic one is uh, time series from the stock market. Um, you maybe have very regular samples for the, for the day. On the weekend, you don't have samples. On national holidays, you don't have samples. Um, so constructing some sort of model, you need to interpolate between that. Um, another pretty classic thing that will happen is there is just a delay in your system that's stochastic. Um, you're sampling from, you're reading out from some sensor. It will come in at different times. Um, the other thing that oftentimes you'll see in, um, I'm not going to say it's a scientific application, but just to kind of get the mental model, um, when you're dealing with kind of machine arrays, um, where you're reading sensors kind of from an aggregate of, over a lot of different machines or sensory inputs, and you actually reduce those into a single number, um, this machines can all be kind of out of sync. Um, so the, the sampling rate that you're getting from each of them, even if they're constant, you get kind of this staggered, weird pattern. Um, so you need to be able to handle that kind of non-uniform nature. Um, there are kind of a lot of other ones that tend to come up when you're dealing with um, um, the... What's the word? <laughs> um, when you're dealing with sampling from, actually, this is a really, really easy example. When you're dealing with audio, you'll oftentimes also, in a the, in the very clean case, you'll be able to just have this kind of constant sampling rate. Um, in a lot of real world audio, you get cutouts, you get kind of, you're taking, um, you have to stitch together a sequence from potentially different sampling rates that the audio is collected at. Here's one at six hertz, here's one at 16. Um, that can be really, really problematic when you're trying to actually learn about it. Uh, so you need to be able to handle these different frequencies. So let's draw a picture for this quickly here. Um, I have some sequence that's coming in, my, my X's, um, and these are all kind of happening at different times, staggered or not uniform. How can we deal with that? Um, so there are basically three options uh, if you want to use deep learning. There are a few others, but for intents and purposes, there are three. The first one is you it just ignore the temporal component. I tend to do this a lot. Most people tend to do this a lot. The second case is you can resample. Um, so you can resample your time series to make it uniform, or you can use the time delta as a feature. So these are three very simple ways that you can handle this. So what do these look like pictorially? So if we ignore time, <laughs> it is kind of exactly what I said. Just strip out the timestamp and stick all the vectors together, assuming they're coming from a uniform sampling. So what can go wrong if we do this? Well, what can go right first is that you ignore a lot of the complexity <laughs> behind the temporal component, and you can feed these directly into whatever models you're using. So that's great. But the big downside is you can actually lose a pretty critical feature of your data and that is the time difference between current time step and the previous time step. That can actually be really, really indicative of, for example, a machine failure. Uh, for example, some future time to event in your sequence. Um, the time differential can be super, super, super important. I will say that it's generally not a bad idea to try as a baseline. It is imposing the inductive bias that the time differential is not important to your problem, but it's a reasonable baseline to try. Um, and if you perform well, you've saved yourself a lot of data pre-processing work. So that's never a bad thing. <laughs> so another option is we can resample. So I can kind of say, hey, I want to sample. Here I'm sampling at 24 second uh, intervals. And I want to construct a sequence that's sampled at individual 24 second intervals. Um, this will be perfect. I now have kind of a, uh, a uniform sampling rate sequence to be able to feed into my model. All is golden, right? Not quite. What do I do with X3 and X4? If I'm, I need to have some sort of reduction to bring these into the time window. So people, time, people oftentimes do some sort of mean averaging. They'll take the latest one, so they'll just take X4 and call that X3. Um, people have a lot of different 
tax in order to get the sampling rate to work out correctly. So you now, instead of kind of dealing with the temporal component, you've kind of traded off and you're now dealing with yet another inductive bias that you're gonna to have to put into your problem, which is how do I reduce multiple time steps within a window? What happens in the gap that is gonna to lead to X4? How do we get a sample in for X4 when we have these kind of uniform time windows that are going into the sequence? Once again, many ways of doing this. Um, people will oftentimes, when you are dealing with uh, continuous inputs, when my Xs are continuous, we'll do some sort of interpolation to get um, kind of a value to impute into X4. So they'll do some sort of cubic interpolation between all the features and they'll imp impute that into X4. Um, you will oftentimes use kind of a backwards filling approach where you say, hey, I don't have anything in my sampling window that would produce my X4. Let me just take the previous X3 and just copy that over. Um, <laughs> you can argue whether or not that's a good idea or not. Um, you'll oftentimes see this particularly done for discrete inputs. So if I don't have the ability to do some sort of interpolation because I have a discrete level set or something, um, they'll just kind of copy the previous level set value over to the next time step. So what does this give us? <laughs> this gives us the ability to ingest data in the format that models are expecting. Just kind of boom, 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 boom. Discrete, uniform time sets. Um, but oh man, <laughs> we are trading a lot of that for uh, data pipeline and data preprocessing complexity. And you now also have an additional set of hyperparameters or kind of per data processing parameters, let's say, to tune. Uh, how do I want to aggregate multiple samples within a window? Do I take the mean? Do I take, uh, do I take the mean and then sample from some sort of normal distribution around that to add some stochasticity? Do I take the max? How do I do that? You also then have to choose the sampling frequency. In my little example here, I just kind of drew some triangles that looked approximately equal. But for a real application, you're, you're gonna say, okay, I have all these things coming in at, at random intervals. Um, how, do you, how do I choose that this should be a 24 second time window? I chose that because it's easy um, and it works with my example, but for real data, that can actually be quite, quite hard um, and can severely impact the performance of your model. Um, and the final one is how do I do that kind of forward filling procedure that I was describing before. When I don't have any samples in the time window that I need to have an X value for, what, what do I choose to put in there? Um, by filling from the previous time step, you can have really, really bad biases creep in. Maybe I have a really, really rare event occur in my previous time step. I probably don't want that rare event to occur in my next time step, even though that's what will happen. Um, so these are all kind of things to consider and yet another dimension that you're gonna need to kind of tweak your data preprocessing pipeline, which, uh, I'm sure none of us want to do more of. Um, so something to consider, but it, it can add a, a significant amount of complexity to how you handle your data before passing into a model. So one of the more elegant approaches to this problem is using this time delta as a feature. So there are lots of ways to do this. I'm going to go into the, the most basic one. So instead of trying to resample or doing anything like this, we say, okay, the time delta for X1 is zero. Now we look at the time difference between my current time step and the previous time step, what are the time stamp differentials, and include that as a numeric feature. You can argue whether or not including a numeric feature for a time differential is a good or bad thing. Let's assume it's a good thing for now. But this actually gives us a sense now of how long it was since our last event, our last sample from the sequence. And we can repeat. So what does this give us? This gives us, once again, the ability to feed directly into a deep learning model that is expecting sample, 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 sample. The one thing that it definitely does do is it over indexes hard on time differential as a feature. <laughs> um, maybe this is not relevant to your problem if you just did a bunch of extra work. That was kind of why I was suggesting using a baseline with ignoring time to start. I think the other thing that can kind of happen here is this assumes that I'm only really affected by the time differential for my last step. Um, should I care about the time difference between my current sample and two time periods ago, three time periods ago, K time periods before? Um, that might be very important. I don't know. <laughs> um, this will be yet another thing that you will have to tune your kind of look back window into figuring out the time differential. Um, this can actually be super, super important. Like if you're dealing with anything that looks roughly like a stock market, um, 
being able to look back multiple time periods is super, super important. Um, not, not an ideal solution, but it gets us the missing amount of information, the missing information that we have in just kind of completely ignoring the time component. So very quick sidebar into representing features in sequences. So we've been kind of, I've been drawing big uh, <laughs> blue rectangles as vectors going in. Um, but there are a few important nuances for dealing with features in sequential models that are just worth calling out quickly as a quick sidebar. Um, understanding your variables that are going in, uh, if you're constructing them, or, um, and, and normalizing them well are of, utmost, of the utmost importance for dealing with sequence models. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later with RNNs, but there are some really, really, really pathological compounding effects that can happen when you deal with sequence models. So having one number that's totally outside of the range can really throw a wrench in the machine, uh, pardon the pun. Um, normalize features to comparable ranges. You don't need to like normal, normalize everything to zero, uh, zero mean unit variance, that's kind of not necessary, but just kind of make sure everything is comparable. Like if you have a bunch of things between like zero and one, I get one, one, zero, three, zero, five, something like that, fine. Uh, don't throw something that can take a value of like 3000 in there too. Um, that's really gonna mess up kind of the state tracking of most of these sequence models. Um, a second point, which is relevant for sequence models, but also just for like general fixed input, fixed output models, just general supervised learning, um, use embeddings for discrete data. Um, using embeddings gives you a lot of pretty key advantages. Essentially what you, using an embedding will do is you say all of the levels of my discrete feature now map to a vector in a lookup table. And I'm saying, for every vector in this lookup table, train this vector as I'm training my model, such that this vector kind of represents where in semantic space this particular discrete level of my feature is. So kind of the classic example of this comes from NLP, natural language processing, with word vectors, um, where you, by training a model with words indexed to individual vectors, you get some really, really nice semantic properties in the vector space. Uh, particularly, you're able to kind of do basic arithmetic on word vectors. Um, <laughs> this is a table that kind of floated around on Twitter and Medium, and it's, it's kind of <laughs> risen and fallen in popularity uh, as people have discovered and rediscovered word vectors. Uh, but you can do interesting things like take Paris, subtract France, and add Italy, and you'll get Rome. Um, so these are kind of semantic vector spaces. And the idea is if you take your discrete feature and you embed it in a vector space while you train, the vector space should admit kind of an interpretable kind of set of arithmetic that will happen. Um, even if it's not interpretable, the amount of information you can encode in a vector of some dimension is like definitionally higher than that of just using a one-hot encoding. So just kind of using a, a dummy variable on off. Um, you can get some pretty big gains in models that are using kind of dummy yes, no flags um, for a discrete feature by just kind of using embeddings. Um, another cute image of what embeddings can do, uh, just to kind of give a, <laughs> a quick motivation, is that they learn these kind of superlative relations, which is quite awesome. Um, I don't know if you can see the text from, from the back, um, but you get interesting kind of similar relationships in vector space between slowest, slower and slow, and shortest, shorter and short. Um, they kind of occupy a similar arc in vector space. So it's a cute kind of anecdote for why there's a lot of information to be stored in vectors and you should kind of use those when dealing with discrete features. So let's take a quick detour now and go into part two of the lecture, which is archetypes of sequence models. A quick drink here. So how do we organize the world of sequence learning? Thus far, we've only talked about how do we represent the inputs? What are some unique characteristics about the inputs of sequence models? Um, how should we reason about them? How can we deal with time? All these sort of kind of nitty gritty, like data level questions. So there are, at least in kind of my super reductivist view of the world for the purposes of this lecture, there are four archetypes of sequence models. Um, I stole and modified this image from Andre Karpathy. Uh, his did not have the one to many. I added the one to many because I was missing. <laughs> um, so, Four 
kind of rough prototypes for how to build a model. The first I like to call predictive. So we're taking a sequence of inputs and predicting a fixed output. The second um, I call abstractive um, because essentially what we're doing is we're taking a sequence as input, we're learning something about that sequence, and then we're generating another sequence, we're transducing another sequence um, from the original sequence. So this became super popular in machine translation, where you're taking a sentence in a source language, English, and outputting the translation in French. So you're actually transducing the sentence into a new domain. The second, so that's kind of many to many. The second many to many archetype within sequence learning is um, what I call labeling. So this is saying for each time step, for each element in my sequence, let me predict something. <laughs> Um, this can either be predict what the next element in the sequence should be, or this could be predict the pressure. This could be predict whether or not this is a signal or background sample from my sequence. Um, but just in general, for every element in the sequence, we're predicting a thing. Um, and the final, um, a little bit more obscure, maybe, archetype of sequence learning um, is, <laughs> for lack of my creativity, captioning. Uh, and the reason it's captioning is because it's usually used for image captioning. Um, kind of the idea here is I take a fixed dimensional input and I'm able to decode a sequence off of that fixed dimensional input. Um, in images, this is taking an image as input and producing a description of what's going on in the image or answering a question about what's going on in the image. Um, I haven't seen examples of this in scientific domains yet. I think it would be really cool if one of you could come up with one. Um, I tried to rack my brain for the past few days to think of an interesting one but I am pretty narrow. I've only kind of worked in a very specific area of HEP. Um, so I think it would be really cool if we came up with something that was fixed input, uh, variable length decoding output. Um, today, most of kind of the insights that I think we're gonna get are gonna come from the first three. Um, they, uh, they come up a lot more frequently. <laughs> um, and they're also just a little easier to, to reason about and find kind of analogs in problem domains. Before I jump in, are there, this is, I want this to be useful. Uh, are there any questions thus far that would help clarify things before we move forward? Yeah, so if, uh, ju just to repeat the question for those who didn't hear, um, when dealing with gaps in sequence data, um, should we have some sort of model that can imbue the ability for a machine learning model to fill in the gaps as we're training? Um, I think there are kind of two schools of thought here. Um, uh, school one is all imputation is bad. <laughs> um, I tend to not agree with that, um, but some people are really adamant that don't impute because the missingness of data is useful. Um, the second school is that, yeah, impute everything we possibly can. Um, if we have missing gap, if gaps in an image, inpaint the image. If we're missing words in a sequence, fill in the words. Um, I would say it's something to test. Um, if you do have some model that can fill in the gaps, fill them and then kind of validate yes or no whether or not it actually affects your downstream task performance. Um, without knowing more details, that's probably the most useful thing I could say. Um, but it, I think it's one of those things to just evaluate from your downstream metric um, of, of kind of how you, how you quantify the system performance. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, yeah, so the, for those who didn't hear, the question is, can we do kind of a captioning approach where you have one thing in, many things out, but have it be such that the four everything that goes in in a sequence, you get like a mini sequence branched off of the sequence. Um, I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> I think it would probably fit most cleanly into the many to many case where you're just stacking like a captioning component in for each one of these blue dots, uh, blue, blue rectangles. Um, I actually don't see why that wouldn't work. Uh, I haven't seen any applications of that since most of these things are developed in NLP. Um, you usually don't see sub sequences, but that would be a really cool architecture to try. <laughs> um, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Yeah, so um, I would say for mo if you're not dealing with language, um, you would learn the embeddings as part of your training procedure. Uh, and the idea is your embeddings will align such that they're maximizing the dimensions of information that are most important to your problem. Um, if you're dealing with text, I'm not sure if you will be, you can use pre-trained embeddings, but kind of the idea of embeddings extends well beyond kind of dealing with pre-trained words of fact that comes from Google. Um, you can use embeddings and they will align within training to be maximally useful. Cool. Uh, 
hopefully that clarified some mid lecture uh, confusion um, or just kind of clarification. Um, cool. So let's jump back in and let's go into a little bit more detail about each of these archetypes. So with many to one, I would say this is the archetype that you will see the most. There are tons of applications of this and HEP, um, the, like taking a sequence in and predicting something out about the sequence is pretty, usually pretty low hanging fruit. Um, taking a sequence saying signal or background, uh, taking an input video, for example, saying, saying whether or not the video is, I don't know, A or B. <laughs> um, but the really, really key kind of thing to get out of the many to one archetype is a lot of the things you learn about fixed input, fixed output models, um, you can use to reason about these as well. You're probably going to be using the same loss functions. Um, I doubt you'll be changing things there. Um, when you start dealing with sequential outputs, your losses starting start getting a little bit different, a little bit wonky. But for variable in, fixed out, um, a lot of the mental models that you develop for kind of standard fixed in, fixed out learning um, tend to work pretty well. Um, so you can kind of swap on a classification layer, a regression layer, you can do some sort of survival analysis thing, tack it on top, um, and those should all kind of work out of the box for many to one. Um, one key thing about all of these archetypes, and this one in particular, is the flexibility. So I kind of hinted at it, just kind of rambling there a second ago, but the inputs, the kind of the red boxes that go into this archetype, they can be really, really complex data. Each one of these can be an image. There's nothing that's stating that this has to be kind of like a boring vector of, of, of inputs. If you, let's say you have like some readout from a telescope, that's some big like 20, 2048 by 2048 image, and that's evolving over time, that can be used here. You can kind of have the, every input to the sequence be an image. Um, so there's nothing about this that kind of restricts the modality of the red boxes. Um, which makes all of these frameworks quite flexible. So let's talk about the second archetype quickly here, um, which is many to many. Um, you'll oftentimes see this referred to in kind of deep learning modernity. I'm gonna put that in big scare quotes um, as sequence to sequence learning, um, even when sometimes it's actually not sequence to sequence learning. Um, the general idea here, as I was alluding to before, is that you're taking some length K sequence as input and producing a length L sequence as output, where K and L can vary and they can be completely independent. Um, that can be quite a hard problem. So in the deep learning archetype for this, you end up breaking down your world into an encoder and a decoder. Um, the job of the encoder in a many-to-many -many model that follows the sequence to sequence paradigm, that the job of the encoder is to take the input sequence and <laughs> summarize it. <laughs> um, I said summarization was bad at the beginning. Here's where some of those inductive biases for our reasoning early on come back to, the chickens come back to roost for lack of a better word. Um, when I summarize a variable length sequence, I'm inherently losing information. So in sequence to sequence learning, it's super important that I have model architectures that are flexible enough that they can learn to summarize what's important before kind of passing them on to the decoder. And the decoder's job is to kind of take the summary information from the encoder and then decode the sequence in the target domain. Whether this might be new uh, weather samples for the next seven time steps. This could be uh, taking a source sentence and returning a summary of the sentence. Um, but I need to have this kind of summary, this, like, this summary in the middle, this vector, this fixed length vector be maximally informative for my decoder to work well. So key key question here is, if you, if you put on your, your, your hat thinking about kind of traditional ML, we're normally just predicting out a single fixed thing. How do I predict a thing that is a variable length? That can be quite tricky. How do I know like I should stop predicting at uh, time step seven? Is that right? Is that wrong? Who knows? Um, how do we reason about that? So this process in NLP is usually called decoding. Um, and I think kind of more generally, it, it can be viewed under the lens of decoding. And essentially what we learn to do in our modeling step, as we're learning the sequence of sequence model, is learn to predict when to stop decoding, which is quite powerful. So we're actually saying, hey, after time step seven, should I keep going or should I stop now? Um, and when you train this, um, you're, actually being, you're actually able to feed in kind of the truth label of that. You know when your target sequence stops for your training data, but when you then have test data, um, and you're feeding in a test input example, when you decode, you kind of go step by step and ask whether or not I should continue or should I stop. 
Um, so this gives us kind of a differentiable approximation to this stop. Um, and this is commonly referred to as a stop token in NLP. Um, but I think the, the application is much more broad than just NLP. Being able to predict when to stop decoding a sequence um, is super critical if we have um, kind of this different length between your input and your output. Most of the problems that this has worked on haven't been that long, kind of as you would imagine, but I don't actually imagine this being any, if, if the signal is there for the stop to be predicted, it should be able to, to learn that. Um, there are other kind of engineering concerns that come up with very, very long sequences. Um, they're just really hard to fit on a GPU. <laughs> um, but if the signal is there for you to stop, if there is like <coughs> signal in the noise to learn when to stop, I don't see why it wouldn't kind of be able to, to perform that. Um, once again, I would test it. <laughs> um, but there's nothing kind of theoretically or from a prior that would tell me that that wouldn't work. Yeah, so in the, in the, I'll talk about NLP and then non-NLP. And non -NL, in NLP, you just kind of have an additional word in your vocabulary, which is stop. In non-NLP, you end up having two losses. You'll have your loss that's for your problem that you actually care about, which is predicting the next element of the sequence. So this could be predicting out the sensor readout, could be predicting temperature pressure, whatever. So that could be some regression loss. Then you have an additional loss, which is like a classification loss which will predict for the next token whether or not I stop or not, or for the next element of the sequence whether or not I stop. So you end up kind of having this just two losses. Um, of course, then there's a whole other uh, set of problems which arise in how to balance these two losses. Um, but in principle, there's kind of nothing that stops you from combining a classification loss that tells you when to stop from a domain loss that tells you what your next sequence should be, what your next element in the sequence should be. You'll oftentimes see people use cost sensitive learning in relation to stop tokens where they upweight the very, very imbalanced class a little bit um, to make it such that uh, it's not completely squashed out by the super, super long sequences. Um, I think that's something that just gets tuned, but it's not, it's not insurmountable. So the second archetype within many to many is what I like to call sequence labeling. Um, so sequence labeling is super, super flexible actually. Um, there are kind of two things that people generally do with sequence labeling. They either are predicting the next time step, what is my value of my sequence going to be in time t plus one, or they're predicting some observables that they care about from the system at time t. Um, so these are kind of the two approaches that people tend to take. Um, you'll oftentimes see for problems where we care about forecasting, just for the next time step, people will set up their problem like this. So if I'm doing a stock prediction problem, let's say, I, I know stock prediction is pretty trite, but it's kind of the classic. Um, you would feed in the stock prices at every time step and just be predicting out the stock price at the next time step. Um, this will oftentimes come up when you are dealing with kind of sequential forecasting where you just kind of care about the next time step. Um, the case where you're predicting something about the current time step T, um, that also tends to arise pretty frequently. In NLP, this is, kind of predicting part of speech per word, but more broadly, this can kind of be whether or not an element of my sequence of machine readouts is a failure mode or not. Uh, I can be predicting whether or not the machine is in an errored state at kind of any point along my time series, which is reading out kind of something from a sensor grid. Um, so this is a pretty flexible framework for being able to reason about every state at a point in time. So the one-to-many archetype, um, this is the one that I said I don't have good examples from kind of something that's not NLP. Uh, so this, in, in the world of NLP, this is the case where we will take either an image or um, a fixed piece of data and decode a description of the data in kind of natural language. So the idea here is um, you take fixed input and at every time step as you're decoding, you're looking back at the image or you're looking back at the fixed amount of data and you're saying, what should I predict next? until I then predict to stop decoding my sequence. Um, an example that maybe doesn't fall into NLP is given a, given a frame one, can I predict the next four, 24 frames of video? You could do something like this to kind of generate little videos from a static image. Um, I could imagine that potentially being useful. Um, but like I said, the canonical problem really is image capturing. So now that we have this kind of zoo of sequence labeling and sequence learning modules 
all these different archetypes. How do we actually go about building them? Um, there are some, there's some interesting characteristics of um, sequence learning models that we need to have kind of reflected in our uh, deep learning building blocks. Um, temporal invariance, we need to be able to control kind of the explosion and reduction of gradients. Um, there are kind of a lot of edge cases that come up in sequence learning. So let's kind of take a look through some of the basic building blocks here. So this is a very, very active area of research. Um, kind of almost every day, some new big company or big research group has a new variant on an existing kind of approach for modeling sequences. We're gonna cover the main three. Um, the first two a little bit more in depth than the third, but we're gonna cover RNNs, recurrent neural networks, um, convolutional neural nets, and transformers. Um, there are a ton of other variants which you will see come up. There are quasi RNNs, there are like a, <laughs> attentive convolutions, there are like gated convolutions, there's a whole kind of zoo of modifications of these three building blocks that have come up. But my hope is that by just kind of reasoning through the, these three basic ones, you'll be able to get a sense kind of, of, of what the field looks like from a, from a high level. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, be able to Google and reason about things that you read in the paper. Um, so let's start with RNNs. So the core of an RNN is we want to have a neural network unit that can learn kind of a sequence-based dependency over time. And what does this look like? So if I have some input that's coming in X, kind of over time sequentially, I want to be able to kind of loop back through, modify a state, and produce an output. So this is a hard diagram to reason about. Why don't we unfold this where it's a little bit easier to reason about? Every time step I have a vector x coming in, I'm basically taking a look and saying, do I want to modify my state? And the idea is this internal state, as we kind of chunk through the sequence, will learn useful things about my task at hand, predicting y, for example. So I have this internal state. As I chunk through my sequence, I am learning what to store, what not to store. A key element here is that the transformation that is kind of going and taking x and producing this, the hidden state is invariant per time step. So I basically have one neural network unit that is just getting stamped out per time step. So that's pretty powerful. Um, that gives us uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> we don't have to engineer features that kind of take into account the temporal component anymore. We have something that just gets applied time step by time step. So what are some issues that can arise with a model such as this? So we're gonna take a quick detour into kind of the internals of how a vanilla RNN works to kind of try to shed some light on this. So this is the kind of most basic RNN you can draw. Let's walk through what the, the math is telling us here quickly from an intuitive level. So we're saying, this is the state that I'm going to next given my input. So how do I get to that state? Well, I wanna do something with the previous state. What did my model know about in the last time step? And I also wanna do something with the current time step. Um, so I look at my previous state, I look at my vector x now, and that will help me decide where to go next. Sounds great, right? No. <laughs> so let's take a look again at this vanilla RNN and try to understand what happens when we take a gradient. Yes. So the dimension of ST can, that, that's, a, that's a hyperparameter. So you actually will choose the dimension of your hidden state in, in your model. Um, you would tune that with your data. <coughs> so what happens when we try to, try to take a gradient? So you don't need to memorize the proof. Uh, this is just to kind of get intuition over on why training RNNs are hard. So we're gonna take the derivative of some loss function with respect to the parameters W rec. This is the thing that is taking the previous state and moving it to the next state. So there's an interesting little element in here, which is when we're taking the derivative of current state with respect to every previous state that has happened kind of in my sequence, the, every previous state that I predicted in my sequence. So this is actually a product of Jacobians. So we don't need to know how we get to this proof, but let's kind of step through kind of what the math will tell us. So we have this, kind of infinite product, this, this, very, this very large product kind of over my entire length of my sequence of multiplying all of these DSI, DSI minus one throughout time. So we can decompose it 
And then we can use some tricks to try to bound the norm of every single element in this very, very long product above. And because we know how to decompose this as a product of Jacobias, we can then split apart WREC itself, a diagonalized component, and we can bound this above by the two eigenvalues, one of W, one of kind of this diagonal component here. We don't need to worry how we get there, but the interesting thing here is since every single element, WSI, uh, sorry, uh, DSI over DSI minus one is kind of a product of two numbers that are eigenvalues. When we take this really, really long product, you're taking a lot of things and multiplying them together. When you take a lot of things and multiplying them together, you kind of have a point of criticality around one. So if you have small eigenvalues, you can rapidly go to zero and the gradient can rapidly go to zero. Or if you have very big eigenvalues, the gradient can explode. So you have something that's getting multiplied over and over and over again, and your point of criticality ends up around one, you can explode, or you can kind of shrink infinitesimally small in your gradient calculation. So that can be super, super problematic when you're dealing with very long sequences. So this is kind of an intuitive argument for if we, if we take the norm of, of, of kind of an element of, my, of the gradient, I can reason about what will happen when I have very, very, very long sequences. Yes? That's true, but I, there's no way to kind of know that a priori. So yeah, I can have behavior that I, I maybe my the network diverges and I have no idea why. Maybe it's because some of them are super small, some of them are super big, and this product is really, really kind of, I, I, I can't bound this. I don't know, I don't have any guarantees that this will be either reasonably sized, big or small. Um, so if the conditions are right, the gradient can just go to zero or can get very, very big. So the natural question arises, how do we fix this? So this is referred to commonly as the vanishing or exploding gradient problem. Um, intuitively, the solution is to decide what to forget and what to remember. So essentially what, what ends up happening kind of, if, if you want to personify an RNN, is they have really, really vivid memories of things that are totally irrelevant, um, which is kind of just a funny mental model to have about an RNN. Um, so we need to control how updates uh, affect that little very, very large product or very, very small product that happens in the middle of the gradient set. So the solution is LSTMs <laughs> uh, from Hochreiter and Schmidt-Huber. So I'm just gonna talk about LSTMs in particular because they have, they were kind of the first to control this mechanism, but there have been a lot of you know, other developments around GRUs, other variants of the state management of RNNs that have solved this problem. Intuitively, what an LSTM does is it's allowing for a trainable decision function to be embedded inside the, the RNN. And what this will do is you basically now have a trainable differentiable ability to forget and remember state. So at every time step, your model is saying, do I want to remember what's happening now? Do I want to forget it? Do I want to write it to my memory? Or um, do I read from memory? So you now have kind of four operations that can help you kind of systematically process your sequence in a way that won't let you kind of dramatically forget or over-remember kind of irrelevant time steps in your sequence. Pictorially, um, I stole this uh, image from Michaela, she's sitting right there. Um, <laughs> Specifically, they have kind of three key mechanisms that are added. Um, no need to know the math that goes into this directly, just kind of useful to take a look at the picture and understand the individual components that are affecting this behavior. So there's a forget gate. The forget gate is basically saying how much of the previous state should be retained in the new state? How much should I forget? The input gate is deciding how much of the current time step actually matters for the problem. I might process a time step and look at it and say, hey, this is totally irrelevant for my task, just forget it. And the output gate is kind of controlling <laughs> the, the mixture of all of these gates um, in composing the final state. So you've got three trainable components basically that are deciding what to keep, what to forget. Um, and that's a really, really powerful mechanism that helps us control the gradient, but also gives us a pretty interpretable way of reasoning about the like, differentiable state of an RNA. So, We've talked about processing sequences in a forward fashion. Can we have a state to process a sequence in reverse? Uh, and this ends up being actually quite important um, in a lot of NLP applications and actually even in um, high energy physics, uh, it was figured out that bidirectional 
RNNs, which we'll talk about in a second here, are very, very useful for performing well. Yes? Not necessarily. There is kind of this notion of memory. So you can like take a state and write it into like, you have kind of a, a matrix that gets passed in through an LSTM, that is the memory. So you can take a state and like sh shove it into memory and then recall it again in a future time set. So you, you can, for, you can that would be the H. Cool, so if we kind of run, we can run an RNN forwards and we can run an RNN backwards. And this gives us uh, an interesting ability to reason about um, what's happening in the sequence in a forward and backward direction, which can actually be super, super powerful. Um, you'll end up finding a lot of um, different information is stored in a sequence when processing it in reverse, which is kind of counterintuitive, um, but it ends up happening a lot. There was a really interesting paper where um, they were actually able to get very, this is a while back, they were able to get reasonable performance in machine translation, processing sequences entirely in reverse. And the places where that model produced errors were actually very different than the model that was run forwards. Um, so just kind of an interesting exercise in the orthogonality of information that's learned, uh, depending on how uh, your sequence is presented to the model. So how does an RNN like this fit with our archetypes? So in the many to one case, we can kind of take this RNN that's processing things, boom, 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 and we can take the last hidden state. And that last hidden state, ideally, if our model is well-trained, will kind of be a trained summary of kind of everything that's happened in the model thus far. So the idea here is we take this last hidden state, this is a fixed dimension, and this can then be fed into whatever loss I'm using for my problem. I can then kind of have whatever outputs I need to reach the dimensionality for my target. Um, but I can kind of take the last state of an RNN and use that directly in a many to one problem. Oops. Um, in the many to many case, I can kind of take the last hidden state of an RNN, the very, very last time step, and I can use that as the initial state for my decoder. So I can take, okay, I've processed my input sequence. What do I think about the full sequence now? Feed that as the initial state to my decoder that's then making reason, reasoning about how to produce my output sequence. In the many to many case, we kind of already have our work done for us. We're predicting a hidden state at every single time step as we proceed. So why don't we just tack a layer on top of the hidden state and be able to predict something about the current time step T. So every single time step, we get our state, predict something about it. Get our state, predict something about it. Um, so this kind of naturally falls out of using RNNs. Um, the interesting thing about the one-to-many case is we're essentially taking, a, let's say we're dealing with image captioning. You can kind of take the full image, have some featureizer for the image, take a pre-trained comnet, for example, and you can stick that as the initial hidden state in the decoder. Um, so then you can generate the sequence from kind of an initial state, which is governed and conditioned by the fixed input. So RNNs at a summary level. We are processing time steps one at a time, and we're modifying the internal state to keep track of what's useful for the task at hand. Um, RNNs are governed by this time invariant transformation that is applied to every element in the sequence, kind of regardless of if it comes first or last. Um, and you can also traverse sequences backwards, which can be very useful. Um, oftentimes you'll learn relatively orthogonal pieces of information uh, to what you would learn processing the sequence forward. So let's talk about the second major building block of deep learning for sequence learning. Um, we're gonna talk about convolutional neural nets. So usually comnets are thought about uh, for image problems where we're dealing with uh, kind of 2D patches of an input, the input image that are having filters applied to them. This can be extended pretty trivially to deal with sequences. So this is a standard convolution operator. Essentially what we can do is we can form an image, if you will, where we take out every vector and we kind of line them all up in a row as kind of a vector image. Um, and then we can take a convolution in one dimension across that sequence. So pictorially, kind of what happens is we take on the diagram on the left, our filter size would be three. We're kind of taking the information from X1 through X3 and summarizing this using a convolutional operator and then getting some output that's kind of the red dot. Um, and we kind of take that filter and apply it to every grouping of three in the sequence, um, which kind of gives us a standard convolution, which um, kind of summarizes the features. Um, once again, that word summarizes. <laughs> uh, summarizes the features that are in my sequence. So just to kind of illustrate how we parameterize convnets, they're usually parameterized by the stride and the filter size. 
Um, the strata and the filter size are controllable and end up kind of imbuing a lot of kind of structural priors that you might have about your data. Um, on the left, I've kind of shown stride one, filter size three. But as I increase my stride, uh, every single feed, every single kind of element that comes out of my convolution operator is has a wider like kind of look around window, if you will. Um, every element that comes out knows more about its context than if I have a smaller filter. And kind of the stride parameter tells us um, how much we want these filter windows to overlap. So I can control both of these, they'll affect my dimensionality and they'll also kind of affect the degree to which context is carried into my window. Um, so this is kind of a pretty powerful thing to be able to control both of these, um, which can affect kind of the learnability of, of the problem ahead. So the simplified map behind kind of what will happen in a CNN filter is each of those arrows that I had on the previous slide are a vector. And essentially my output is just each of these vectors dotted with the input vector xi. Um, so fairly simple, just at the individual kind of time step level. Um, but once you get bigger, you wanna use kind of official convolution operators that will do this um, and they'll scale much better on a, on a GPU. So interesting trends in CNNs for sequence learning. Um, <laughs> Go back about four years, everyone was, was doing only RNNs. Then there's kind of the like CNN trend it was mostly kind of started by FAIR and a few others um, that kind of what you used to think you had to do with RNNs, you can actually do with CompNets, um, which is kind of an interesting trend away from the complexity on controlling state and all of these things that are inherent to RNNs. Um, and this kind of raises a pretty big question about most sequence modeling problems, which is do we actually need to retain state? So we have all these mechanisms that are reading and writing to state, reasoning about state. Are, are they actually necessary? Because uh, comnets don't know about state. There's no kind of notion of reading, writing, forgetting as we process a sequence. It's just kind of a standard convolution operator, yet they perform well. So I think it, it kind of raises an interesting question of if RNNs are reasoning about state, is that state really necessary? So an interesting thing about convolutions is that they don't know about order. Um, in particular, uh, they don't know about, sorry, they, not order, they don't know about position. So they are translation invariant, but that also means that they don't know kind of what came before it. If I apply a convolution operator to time step 17, it doesn't know about time step 16. So kind of a way that people have gotten around this in the deep learning world is by using what's called a position encoding. And a position encoding is a very simple idea. I basically train an embedding as we were discussing earlier, and I have an additional feature that is an integer kind of one through n, where n is my maximum sequence length, and I learn a vector for every position. So instead of just having my features x, I have my features x plus a position vector p, and that p vector is either trained or fixed, but that, that position vector kind of tells me where I am in the sequence and can form a convolution operator where it is being applied in the sequence. Um, so the, you're embedding that, right? So every single position has an embedding. So there, there, there's no dynamic range that will come up. Every single vector, every single position has a vector. And that vector kind of gets added to my time step. So P isn't necessarily the number one through 50,000. P is the, looked up, the, the, the retrieved embedding associated with that position. So I have a trainable embedding per position. And the embeddings you can constrain to be between negative one, one, whatever you want. Um, but the, the raw like position ID <laughs> isn't going into the model. Yeah, so padding, padding is a whole other uh, topic which we actually won't get into today. Um, but I, I will just kind of say padding is not trivial for comments. Um, how to do it efficiently is also not trivial. Essentially people end up kind of tacking on additional time steps to make the convolutions work out and then deleting them kind of after the forward pass, um, which is not elegant, but um, it's hard to do these with uh, GPUs without doing that. I have no idea, probably GRU, fewer parameters. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, that is a, it's a highly architecture dependent question. Um, if I have a computer architecture that can fuse the operators that are required for a GRU more efficiently than an LSTM, a GRU is gonna be more efficient. Um, but that depends on the target architecture that you're deploying onto, whole suite of other things. Um, first dab would be GRU, but I don't actually know. <laughs> So very quickly, how does this fit with our archetypes? So 
if I need to get a fixed length vector to be able to use this many to one archetype, how do I get a fixed length vector out of my convolution output? Unfortunately, I need to do a reduction. <laughs> um, the idea is since my kind of elements that are going into the reduction are trainable, the reduction should be more informative. This is kind of a hot topic in NLP that a lot of people who come from a linguistics background hate this. Um, I think it's kind of uh, an atrocity, <laughs> but in Comnets, if you need to get a summary number, like a fixed length vector, you do need to have a summary that gets applied on top of it, whether it's a min, max, mean, um, some collection of these, that does kind of need to get applied. In the many-to-many -many case, you end up using what are called dilated convolutions to be able to obtain kind of the sequential dependence on the fact that time step t can't know about time step t plus one. So this is a great gift from DeepMind, if it'll play, yeah, of kind of what a dilated convolution looks like, um, where you're only looking at kind of the previous time steps when uh, constructing your convolution for the next uh, time step to get decoded. Um, so this is kind of what's used in many-to-many uh, -many with kind of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence transduction style approach. Um, in the many-to-many -many case where we're doing sequence labeling, CNNs are a very, very natural fit. Um, you're outputting a number per time step. You might need to do some padding, but you're outputting kind of a thing per step along kind of my input sequence. So you can very easily tack on additional uh, layers or additional losses to be able to learn um, kind of the time step dependent features that you want to be able to predict. Um, and then for the one-to-many case, you're once again going to be using dilated convolutions to get that dependence um, and probably some positional encoding. But I don't expect, I don't think anyone's actually done comnets with one to many, at least as an academic paper. So a summary of CNNs. We're essentially using kind of filters without a notion of state. You can use some positional encoding. And we have this time invariant uh, transformation that gets applied per time step of this kind of convolution operator taking my filter, applying it to my vectors. Um, for the many to one use case, which is unfortunate, we do need this ability to reduce the, the sequence into kind of a fixed length vector. So, will be mean, min, max, summary. Um, you need to have a summary statistic that's kind of getting you your fixed length vector at the end. Um, so RNNs, CNNs, these are kind of two of the central building blocks of um, kind of how people build the individual components inside these archetypes we've talked about. Um, the last thing I want to talk about pretty briefly um, is paying attention. <laughs> um, so you've all probably heard, if you follow deep learning at all, about attention. Um, it's gotten a ton of hype. And intuitively, what attention is, is, is the ability for any deep learning model, whether it's an RNN, NTN, and what have you, to be able to focus on other parts of the input in order to reason about what to do next. It's very anthropomorphic, I know, but uh, the math is usually painfully simple. <laughs> but that's kind of the, the story that uh, you'll get told about what attention is actually doing. Um, it can, like I said, it can be used with RNNs, it can be used with CNNs. It originally gained pop popularity in machine translation, where you're kind of doing these soft alignments, where you're looking back through and saying, ah, in my source sentence, I'm saying the word dog. In French, I need to say chien. I need to focus there. Um, so you have these kind of very explicit um, kind of attention components that are looking uh, at the sequence. Um, Self-attention, um, which is kind of a very Google thing. They've done a lot of interesting work around transformers, which we'll talk about next. Um, is basically the idea that a, sen a sequence can attend to itself. So as time step t, I can look at time steps one through t minus one and t plus one through k or n or whatever, and I can use that to form context about what I should be thinking at time step t. Um, the idea behind self-attention is you don't need any recurrence, you don't need any convolutions, you can just kind of look elsewhere in the sequence and make a, like a, a judgment about what your time step out should, output should be. Um, if you're interested in kind of this approach, this is the classic paper. It has like, it's only two years old now and it has like 3,000 citations. Um, so do take a look at attention is all you need because that was kind of the first um, kind of real large scale application of self attention. So, quickly, in the last few minutes here, um, before I open up the questions, I want to talk about transformers. Um, transformers now in 2019 are kind of the classic fully attentive model. So, no recurrence, no convolutions. They're, every time step is just looking at all the surrounding time steps and making a judgment about itself. Um, and the key idea is you kind of let sequences do key value lookups with themselves. So as the vector of time step t, 
I do a key value lookup across all the other time steps in the sequence. Maybe I take a dot product to get a score, something like that. And I kind of construct a summary, once again, for myself, given my relationship with all of the other elements of the sequence. Um, all of these models have what's called a read head, um, which is an interesting kind of piece of nomenclature that's gotten adopted now, I which is a, the answer to that one. Okay, apparently Siri wants to jump in. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the read heads are an interesting kind of construct where you, um, for a model to be able to reason about itself, you, you, it's kind of a discrete thing. Uh, an individual vector can only take dot products with other vectors and do kind of one summation with itself. So you need to have multiple of these to be able to have multi-attention. Um, it's kind of a jargon-filled word, but kind of the key idea is it allows your individual kind of elements of your sequence to be able to focus on different things at the same time. So this is the diagram of the transformer from the paper. It's a mess. Um, it's actually a pretty simple idea, but the diagram um, <laughs> makes it look pretty complicated. <laughs> um, just to break it down super quickly, on the left, you've got this encoder. All the encoder is doing is it's taking its input sequence, looking at all the other uh, sequence elements in the sequence, and then outputting a new sequence where every time step has just looked at all of its neighbors. And the decoder is basically doing the same thing where not only is it looking at itself, but it's also looking at the encoder. It's not super complicated, but this picture like, gets people all the time. <laughs> um, the overly simplified version, if you want to kind of draw a really, really convoluted arrow diagram, is as follows, where you kind of have every vector x looking at every other vector um, and kind of constructing a vector h of kind of a summary statistics of all the other vectors that are in the sequence. So lots of kind of complicated operators in TensorFlow slash PyTorch, whatever you use, that get transformers to work. So we're not going to go into all the math here. Uh, but just kind of note the general idea of a transformer is no recurrence, no convolutions, just kind of raw attention. Um, why are transformers useful? Um, they model long-term dependencies explicitly. So a model is explicitly able to look back and say, hey, this time step, like 300 time steps ago, was important for my problem. Um, it is near state of the art for pretty much every transduction problem that exists today. Um, probably not very useful for many to one style problems, unless you just got like a boatload of compute that you want to throw at something. Um, kind of, it was designed for sequence transduction at the end of the day, um, but it's a super, super powerful model. So how to pick building blocks. Um, people will usually ask about like, what's the best thing to choose for my problem? Um, I have no idea, and I don't think anyone who tells you they know uh, usually has a hidden agenda. Um, the, <laughs> the secret is to just test them all <laughs> if you really do want to know what's best. There is no free lunch at the end of the day. Um, and certain problem characteristics um, resonate well with particular model architectures. If you've got really complicated state that you need to reason about, maybe an RNN might be good. If you just need to kind of pick an element in the past of your sequence and like use that to predict, maybe uh, an attention-based transformer is kind of the right way to go. But there really is no free lunch. It's impossible to know what is best. So, concluding remarks before we open up the questions. Um, sequence learning is super flexible. Um, I hope I gave you a pretty high level overview of what all the building blocks are that can be fit together, what the different archetypes are. Um, there are four main flavors, the many to one, the many to many where we're doing a sequence, do a sequence, the many to many where we're labeling every element in the sequence, and kind of this one-to-many unicorn that I've talked about that I'm looking for an interesting application of. Um, there are a lot of building blocks to choose from with more coming out every day on Archive. Um, the base fundamental ones that you might want to know about are RNNs, CNNs, and transformers. Um, and the really important thing to remember when you're building a sequence model is that there's no kind of best approach. Should I encode time as a delta? I don't know. Try it. <laughs> uh, should I use an RNN or a CNN? No idea. Try them both. Um, there really is no free lunch. <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough. A lot of kind of blog posts that accompany papers have very grandiose claims that like this new thing is better than all of the prior art that came before. It's usually not true. Um, they usually pick pretty poor baselines. <laughs> um, so do kind of try out everything for yourself. Um, and yeah, remember there is no free lunch for sequence learning. So, thank you. <laughs>